today on CLC. So I need to make it abundantly clear from the beginning that we are not allowed, I am not allowed, we are not allowed to cherry pick verses and just blurt them out because it agrees with our own religious or theological dispositions or even our own worldview or philosophical pattern of thinking. Even one verse is still the main ingredient to the thesis of the entire Bible, which is redemption. But as one reads the story, and I think even by the time you get to verse 3 or 4, one would soon realize that this love of Amnon was more than just love. It was plain sexual lust from the beginning. Good morning. So far over the last number of weeks, we have dealt with Galatians chapter 1, verses 1 through 5. Um, if you've missed it, you can always go onto our YouTube page or our website and you can catch up on those verses today. However, I only want to deal with one verse. And that is verse 6 of Galatians chapter 1. Because once again, there's always the time factor that forever seems to be against us. And furthermore, you need to understand that most of the verses within this book, within this chapter, are so loaded. Each verse is so loaded with deep theology that even just where one verse can be very enlightening and fulfilling Nevertheless, one needs to also bear in mind that although it is only one verse, we still need to keep within the construct and the framework and context of Galatians chapter 1. So I need to make it abundantly clear from the beginning that we are not allowed, I am not allowed, we are not allowed to cherry pick verses and just blurt them out because it agrees with our own religious or theological dispositions or even our own worldview or philosophical pattern of thinking. In other words, and again let me remind you and drive home the point that we do not use verses out of the Bible to agree with our thinking. But our thinking needs to be brought into submission and agreement agreement with the Bible as a whole even when it comes to one verse because even one verse is still the main ingredient to the thesis of the entire Bible which is redemption. 2 Corinthians 10 3 to 5 says for though we walk in the flesh we are not waging war to the flesh for the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but have divine power to destroy strongholds. Now listen to this, verse 5. We destroy arguments and every lofty opinion against the knowledge of God and take every thought captive to obey Jesus Christ. So therefore, for the sake of context, I would like us to turn to Galatians chapter 1, if you're not there already. And we're going to be reading from verses 1 through 10. And our concentration will be on verse 6. Galatians chapter 1, verse 1 through 10. Paul, an apostle, not from men, nor through man, 
but through Jesus Christ and God the Father, who raised him from the dead. And all the brothers and sisters who are with me to the churches of Galatia, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins to deliver us from the present evil age according to the will of God, our God and Father, to whom be the glory forever and ever. Amen. I am astonished that you are so quickly deserting him who called you in the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel. Not that there is another one, but there are some who trouble you and want to, to distort the gospel of Christ. But even if we or an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel contrary to the one we preach to you, let him be accursed. As we have said, so now I say again, if anyone is preaching to you a gospel contrary to the one you received, let him be accursed. For am I now seeking the approval of man or of God? Or am I trying to please man? If I were still trying to please man, I would not be a, your Bible says, servant. The word there is slave of Christ. Let's pray. Our Father, our God, once again it's Sunday, it's the Lord's Day, and we've come here, Lord, to worship you, not just through music, but we've come here to worship you with our souls through your word, because your word invigorates us and illuminates us. It causes a deep worship within us to see how great our God really is. Although it's one verse this morning, we ask you that you would again illumine our souls our hearts, that we might see you and contrast ourselves and see that which is still not right within us and then cling to you, Father, because you're the only one that can sanctify through your Holy Spirit. So through your word this morning, I pray, would you sanctify us, teach us, and let your word be true. Although it's a mere man, your servant speaking, again I ask you, guard my mouth. In Jesus' name, Amen. Before we deal with verse 6 of Galatians, I would like to start off by way of introduction and use this introduction as a segue into Galatians verse 6 and tell you a tragic story which is found in the Old Testament. Now, there are just a whole plethora of stories I could have chosen because everyone would have brought the same point across. But I feel that the story I want to share with you, is f which is found in the book of 2 Samuel, chapter 13, 1 through 29, is an example that could prove to be extremely useful in correlation to Galatians 1, verse 6. Now, I'm not going to deal and read all 29 verses. Although I would encourage you to go home and read the entire narrative of 2 Samuel 13, even through 18, to get the entire context of what is being said there and what actually took place. But suffice it to say, I want to give you a brief account very quickly before we go there on this story and then hone our attention onto selected verses of that narrative in 2 Samuel 13. This is a story of King David's son, Amnon, who raped his half-sister Tamar. It's not the same Tamar from Judah, and Tamar, you will recall that story. It just so happens that the woman is also called Tamar, it's a common name. The tragedy of the story is absolutely manifold and there's just so many points I can give you. I've condensed them into five points. Firstly, Amnon was apparently in love with Tamar as the opening verses of 2 Samuel 13 tells you. But as one reads the story, and I think even by the time you get to verse 3 or 4, one would soon realize that this love of Amnon was more than just love. It was plain sexual lust 
from the beginning. All he was doing, as the book of 2 Peter 3, 3 tells us, is following after his own lusts. Secondly, because of Amnon's lust, his crafty friend Jonadab comes up with what seems to be an outstanding plan. But let me add also a rather devilish plan in order to make Amnon's so-called dream come true and thereby fulfilling his sexual lust that would become a contingent eventuality for him with regards to having sexual intercourse with his half-sister Tamar. Thirdly, Amnon was graciously warned twice by Tamar, whom he was about to rape, that what he was about to do would not only be utterly immoral and profane, but would be a curse to him to do such a foolish thing. Fourthly, it would bring shame not only on Amnon, in all of Israel, but also on Tamar as well, who, by the way, is the innocent victim over here. Fifthly and finally, and also quite ironically, the outrageous and foolish action of Amnon literally brings about the curse of which Tamar warned him about, and it results in his own death because his own, because his own brother Absalom has him killed, murdered. One thing I have to tell you, family, that is very striking within this extremely tragic story is that, as I said, it has a sort of correlation of what we are dealing with in the book of Galatians as a whole. And especially seeing that we are specifically dealing with verse 6 at this stage. Therefore now, I have given you this very brief rundown of the story. I would now like to turn our attention to the few verses in the narrative found in 2 Samuel 13. And if you want to turn there, take your time now because I want us to read it together. And then after we've read those verses, I'm going to, as I said, use that as a segue and get stuck into verse 6 of Galatians. So as we read the following verses, I need you to understand that I have taken the liberty already to amplify certain verses that you will not find in your Bible from the Hebrew so that you would have a fuller understanding and picture of what is actually taking place and what is being said by Amnon and Tamar. So we're going to be reading from 2 Samuel 13. Our selected verses are 1 to 5. Then we'll drop down to 10 to 19. Then we will read 22. And then we'll read 28 to 29. Now Absalom, David's son, had a beautiful sister whose name was Tamar. And after a time, Amnon, David's son, loved her. And Amnon was so tormented that he made himself ill because of his sister Tamar, for she was a virgin, and it seemed impossible to Amnon to do anything to her. Do you pick up already that there's something going on? But Amnon had, had a friend whose name was Jonadab, the son of Shemir, David's brother. And Jonadab was a very crafty man. And he said to him, John, um, uh, uh, um, sh um, sorry, Jonadab says to Amnon, he said to him, O son of the king, why are you so haggard morning after morning? Will you not tell me? Amnon said to him, I love Tamar, my brother Absalom's sister. Jonadab said to him, Lie on your bed and pretend to be ill. And when your father comes to see you, your father David, by the way, the King David, comes to see you, say to him, Let my sister Tamar come and give me bread to eat and prepare the food in my sight that I may see it and eat it from her hand. 
Then Amnon said to Tamar, Bring the food, verse 10. Then Amnon said to Tamar, Bring the food into the chamber, that I may eat from your hand. And Tamar took the cakes she had made and brought them into the chamber to Amnon, her brother. But when she brought them near to him, he took hold of her and said to him, Come lie with me, my sister. She answered him, No, my brother, and I'm going to break it down. Do not violate. The Hebrew word there is or oh, no. Almost sounds like oh no. What does it mean? Let me give you the full context. No, my brother, do not afflict me. Do not afflict me intentionally. Do not hurt me. Do not bring me down in this forceful manner. Not caring for me as a person. But we find it simply, no, my brother, do not violate me. But that's the meaning. Do not intentionally hurt me. Don't bring me down. For such a thing is not done in Israel. Do not do this outrageous thing. And again, I amplify this with the Hebrew ver version of Nebela or Nebola, which comes from Nebal, meaning senseless disgraceful folly and profane action bringing death and punishment so if we read that in context it would say this for such a thing is not done in israel do 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 not do this meaningless senseless disgraceful folly and profane action that will bring death and punishment verse 13 as for me where could i carry my shame and as for you, you would be as one of the outrageous fools. There again we get Nebolo from the word Nebol. You would be as one of the disgraceful and profane fools. Immoral, bringing judgment and even death upon yourself and unfair punishment on me. And all of Israel. Now therefore, please speak to the king, for he, has not he will not withhold you from me from you. Just speak to the king. Just do things right. Verse 14. But he would not listen to her, and being stronger than she, he violated, and take that word violated and put it back into the Hebrew. He violated her and lay with her. Then Amnon hated her, Here's the irony. Then Amnon hated her with a very great hatred, so that the hatred with which he hated her was greater than the love, the lust, with which he had loved her. And Amnon said, Amnon said to her, Get up, go. Verse 22. But Absalom spoke to Amnon, neither good nor bad. For Absalom hated Amnon because he had violated his sister Tamar. Verse 28. Then Absalom commanded his servants, Mark when Amnon's heart is merry with wine, and when I say to you, strike Amnon, then kill him. Do not fear, I have commanded you. Be courageous and be valiant. So the servants of Absalom did to Amnon as Absalom had commanded now I want to say and I want to give that a, a heading that foolishness kills it's a deceptive delusion the reason I use this specific story is because of the foolishness that kills it ends up bringing death and a deceptive delusion on the part of Amnon and also with regards to the Galatian churches which I shall discuss in a moment Amnon was delusional in his so-called love for Tamar because all it was as I said was a pure unadulterated sexual lust in the scheme of things and also being the son of David David King David Amnon would have been well acquainted with the correct customs and moral demands and commands of the day and how one was to act with moral integrity. After all, it was his father David who was not only king 
But also, as the book of 1 Samuel 13, 14 tells us, was a man after God's own heart. Write that down. 1 Samuel 13, 14 tells us that David was a man after God's own heart. So if he was a man after God's own heart, he would have explicitly told all of his children and everyone that was around him the laws of God. And he would have probably told them that you should meditate on these laws day and night. Write them on your palms, write them on your foreheads, never forget these laws. Act with moral integrity. Love the Lord your God and love your neighbor as you love yourself. Therefore God's laws would have been explicitly known to Amnon. However, he chose to listen to Jonadab, who was referred to in verse 3 as a very crafty man. And further to this is that all he was doing was following after his own sexual lusts. Once again, a direct parallel can be drawn with immediate attention to Genesis 3 verse 1 concerning, and I quote, the serpent who was more crafty than any other beast of the field that the Lord God had made. Furthermore, a direct an immediate parallel can be also drawn to the crafty Judaizers who had influenced the Galatian churches into forsaking their faith in exchange for a quote-unquote law and works. You'll find that in Galatians 2.15-21. Therefore, one could rightfully coin these Juda Judaizers as another Jonadab, crafty and sly. God's true word was being raped, for the lack of a better word. Although the harshness of that word that I just used, raped, I well intend to actually use. Because by and through the Judaizers, and with cunning precision, they had caused many of the Galatians to return back to senseless death and punishment. It is uncanny that what is found in the book of Galatians, although it's in Greek, if you, if you take it back and you put it back into the Hebrew and you fit it into, into, into the story of um, Amnon and Tamar, you would find the exact same wording, senseless, death, and punishment, which comes through the law. The Judaizers had perverted God's word and turned it into something they wanted it to mean. And if it was something they wanted it to mean, then the obvious conclusion would be law only, no grace. I say that because the law kills. How do I know that? 2 Corinthians 3 verse 6 tells us explicitly, the law is a curse and it brings death. It kills. And it also brings disgrace and death on the wicked. And not only on the wicked, on anyone who deems themselves even remotely religious, yet even on the basis of devout religiosity, family, on the basis of devout religiosity where salvation through, through grace alone is missing, death will be the reward of any of your works if you do not have salvation by faith and grace especially when they invade and pervert the grace that came to mankind through Christ's atonement. You need to know that Amnon knew that what he was going to do and ended up doing it in any event, it was clearly and with most certainty wrong. He knew it, and what is more, Amnon was even warned by Tamar two times. Consequently, the foolishness of Amnon literally brought about his own death. But subsequently, it also brought the disgrace of Tamar. Now I want to bring you and, and give another heading, because this has got everything to do as we move into Galatians. I want to give you a heading of calling it an epidemic in, um, influence. An epidemic influence or influenza like an epidemic influenza that started with one, just one person's influence, namely Jonadab, who dev deviously influenced Amnon with what seemed to be wise and pious words 
resulted in dire devastation to both Amnon and Tamar. Well, the ep epidemic did not just end at verse 19 of Samuel 13, but it carried, carried its deadly viral effects over to Absalom and his rebellion against his own father, King David. And as one continues to read the narrative in 2 Samuel, it continues right through to, as I told you in the beginning, 2 Samuel chapter 18, where it ends in the death of Absalom, King David's son. So it was a deadly viral influence from the beginning. Peter, who wrote his letter to the exiles, though they were dispersed in Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, Bithynia, because of the great persecution under Nero, warned the Christians of the very same epidemic that had influenced so many other Christians and churches as well. 2 Peter 3, 1, 3 to 3 says this, and I want to read from the New American Standard Version. This is now, beloved, the second letter I am writing to you, in which I am stirring up your sincere mind by way of reminder that you should remember the words spoken beforehand by the holy prophets and the commandment of the Lord and Savior spoken by our apostles. Know this first of all, that in the last days, mockers will come with their mocking, following after their own, and he has the word, lusts. As we can see from everything I've said, the stories I've told you, the church was and still is under direct attack by Satan and will always use people. Satan will always use people, so-called Christians within the church. It always comes within the church to breed and spread a deadly virus which is always aimed at polluting and perverting God's word in order to blind people from the truth and or to take the m most faithful Christians and lead them astray. Now I want to tell you a story about, it's a true story, of the greatest epidemic that hit the world in historical record. And that's the great influenza of 1918. During the First World War, which started in 1917 by the way, in the year 1918, a virus broke out that set the medical world on fire. The virus started and came from some pigs in western Kansas. Those pigs had somehow contracted a virus from birds. By the way, I haven't got that in yet, but just so that you know, most viruses come from birds. Go and check it out. It's a medical fact. Most viruses are spread through birds. So these pigs had contracted the virus from birds. Those pigs had managed to pass this virus onto some young men who were conscripted into the American army to go and fight in the war. These soldiers were sent to go for training in a camp known as Camp Devons in the eastern part of Kansas. There, was, there were as many as 40,000 men jammed into that camp. Now you need to know that there was a mild flu circulating during the spring of 1918. Just a very mild flu. But the deadly strain of this great influenza appeared on U.S. soil on Tuesday, the 27th of August, 1918. When three Navy dock workers at the Commonwealth Pier in Boston fell ill. Within 48 hours, dozens of men were infected. Ten days later, the flu had decimated the camp of Devons. Now remember, this is 1918. There has been, never been a, an actual cure for any disease. In the history of the world, obviously until 1885. In 1885 was the very first time they could cure, cure a disease, and I forget what the disease, disease is. But this disease that hit them, it set the medical world on fire. They were completely baffled. They never even understood the pathology of disease, the deadliness of it. 
Nobody ever cured anybody of anything. So the art of medicine was deadly rather than life-giving. Medicine in itself was a killer because I didn't have a clue how to deal with viruses. They did not know what to do and they did not understand what quarantine was, neither did they understand what isolation was. Furthermore, they did not understand what a virus was and what it actually did. They didn't even know the difference between bacteria and virus. Unlike bacteria, which is a sort of a quote-unquote medical term, living creature. A bacteria is known as a living creature. A virus is not a living creature. Rather, a virus is a half-living thing that attaches itself to the DNA of a living cell within a human being and encodes itself into the DNA of that human being and then it spreads through the entire cell system of the human being. So to cut a long story short, which is pages long, within a period of 24 months, this great influenza had killed 100 million people. More than the bubonic plague, known as the Black Plague in the 1300s, 1353, I think, or 1346 to 1353, killed more people than the Black Plague and killed more people than both world wars put together. 100 million people this great influenza killed. Now here is where we find the segue into Galatians after I've told you that story. Especially verse 6. Because there also one finds an epidemic that arose within the church and carried over its deadly viral effects to the rest of the Galatian churches. Especially to the faithful Christians. And just so that you know that great influenza, do you know out of the one 100 million people. Do you know the highest percentage of the people that died from the great influenza were the people with the strongest immune systems? The stronger your immune system, the better that virus can spread and encode itself. So the strong immune system is actually helping the virus. So this virus had spread itself into this Galatian church, churches through the Judaizers and it even struck the faithful Christians. And that was because of the actual virus, the Judaizers. It is the same foolishness of the Galatians that Paul mentions in Galatians 3 verse 1. Oh, you foolish Galatians, says Paul, who has bewitched you? In other words, bring it back into the Greek and Hebrew. You senseless and outrageous fools, you have brought punishment and death upon yourself once again by turning back to folly and the curse of the law which brings death. Paul even warns them with absolute vehemence in Galatians 3.13. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is everyone who is hanged on a tree. So verse 6 of Galatians chapter 1. I am astonished that you are so quickly deserting the one who called you by the grace of Christ and you are turning to a different gospel. Now let's look at the word I am astonished or rather the phrase I am astonished. What is the meaning of Paul's heart? What is he trying to get across? Paul is more than just astonished. Because after all, this is not some concert that he's attending or a magical show that has caused him to marvel. Generally, marveling at magic shows or a great musical orchestra or even a great stage drama would be a good type of joyful marveling. However, this is most certainly not the case over here in the quote-unquote real-life drama that is not staged, but is playing out on the stage. 
and it has un unfolded in the Galatian churches. It is more than a drama, but more like a Shakespearean drama that has gone horrendously and superbly wrong. Therefore, Paul is not filled with surprise and wonder in a good way, but on the contrary, he is puzzled, he is gobsmacked, he is nonplussed, he is bewildered, he is perplexed, and he is awestruck out of his senses as to how the Galatians are so quickly deserting God. The one who had called them out of darkness by his grace through Jesus Christ whom they had received with joy at one stage. Grace, family that came freely to them when they were not even looking for the grace or even looking for the redemption for that matter. They weren't searching for it, but it came. And they embraced it freely because it is for free. What makes matters so perplexing, family, is the fact that it was God who through Paul and Barnabas' first missionary journey sought out, God sought personally, he personally sought out the Galatians and freely gave them the gift of, gra gift of grace, salvation and eternal life through the preaching of the gospel, like I'm doing with you this morning. And yet, it seems that they have now trampled it underfoot with almost no forethought, not giving it any consideration at all, and no spiritual discernment. You want some cross-references on spiritual discernment and how we're meant to deal with things when we are meant to make a decision? Yeah, we go write this down. It's so important. Go to the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 14. Go to that same book of 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 10. Go to the book of 1 John chapter 2, verse 26. Go to the book of the same epistle, 1 John chapter 4, verse 1. We are where we as Christians are meant to not give just forethought, but discern the choice we are about to make, like Amnon, who was warned graciously. And at that, at that stage in our lives, the scriptures I've given you are the ones we are meant to lean in. God, give me the wisdom from heaven, so that I might do that which is right. Hebrews 10.29 how much worse punishment do you think will be deserved by the one who has trampled underfoot the Son of God and has profaned the blood of the covenant? Do you see the same words coming up over and over through Old Testament and New Testament? Let me read that again. How much, m worse, more, much, how much worse punishment do you think will be deserved by the one who has trampled underfoot the Son of God and has profaned the blood of the covenant by which he, she was sanctified and has now outraged, done, brought disdain, brought shame upon the spirit of grace. 